Hello and welcome to 10,000 Books and More. I am your host, Lauren, and as those who know me can tell by the sound of my voice, I am still sick. I do ask for my usual disclaimers to let you know that please pardon sound quality and any sounds my cats may or probably will make in the background because today we froze over and everybody's home and the cats are excited so they've been running and romping through the house and attacking things. Again, please pardon any background noises you may hear and any sound quality issues. So today I am going to review three books instead of two because one of them was very short. And so today's first book is going to be The Red Baron by Baron Manfred von Richthofen, who is actually one of my favorite historical people. I have studied him since probably the age of 13 or 14. We will not go into how long ago that was. This version of his book was published by Pen and Sword Military History, on the 15th of January, 2009. It was originally published way back in 1917. This book, it was an ebook that I read and it had 200 pages selling for $8.99 through Amazon's Kindle program, $10.91 for paperback, and $16.37 for hardcover at Amazon. It can also be found online at various used bookstores. Now, The Red Baron is a somewhat embellished autobiography of Freiherr Manfred von Richthofen, known as the Red Baron in World War I. His title of Freiherr translates to, literally will translate to Free Lord, and is often translated as the word Baron in most other languages, this The Red Baron. It was not a hereditary title, however, but it was one that all male members of his family were entitled to. Now, this book does take us through his childhood uh, and teenage years and up until his uh, fighting career as a fighter pilot for Germany in World War I. And it does end with a short dissertation on his absolute love for flying machines. It was written on the instructions of the press and intelligence section of the German Air Force, which is their propaganda department. And then it was heavily edited and censored by them. As it was originally written in 1917 and Rick Tuffin was shot down in 1918, he was killed before a revised edition could be written. He is also on record of having repudiated this book. Anyhow, the book reads almost like a light-hearted adventure regaling in his mischievous youth and pranks. Primarily, it felt like it, the purpose of this book was to show off just how brave and carefree this man was. However, there are a few uncensored comments that show he was not just a, a goofing off, silly uh, gentleman that did nothing but kill and kill at will. One of the quotes he has says, I am in wretched spirits after every aerial combat. I believe that the war is not as the people at home imagine it, with a hurrah and a roar. It is very serious, very grim. A side note also is that Rick Toffin was only 25 years old when he died, so he wrote this when he was 24. Although at times Rick Toffin does come off as arrogant and full of bravado, it does give the reader a glimpse into life of an incredibly skilled fighter pilot. It does show his love of life, his love for his comrades, his family, even his pets. It also gives us a glimpse of what life kind of was like back then with some propaganda. <laughs> so if one does read this book and accepts that a majority of the facts and the attitude of Rick Toffin was altered to please and reassure the very war-torn populace of Germany, it is a fun book to read. I did rate this book four out of five stars due to the obvious censoring and propaganda format of the original publisher. So this is in no way a reflection on the writer, but more the publisher because they were basically saying, oh, look, he's this great, great hero. He's perfect. He's flawless. And the Germans knew how devastating it would be to the morale of the populace should he be shot down and killed. And of course, he was in April of 1918. So my next book is called Snowfall on Mars. It is by writer Brandon Frankel. 
It is published by LRF Publishing, the 31st of May, 2015. There are 367 ebook pages. If you have Kindle Unlimited, this book can be borrowed for free. Otherwise, it is $4.99 to purchase the ebook, $13.99 paperback from Amazon. This is a dystopian or post apocalyptic sci fi. This book does come with a trigger warning from me. This is a very bleak, bleak, dark book, and it does not offer a redeeming future or hope for humanity. This book is very desolate and very grim and a little depressing, but I liked it. A failed terraforming attempt on Mars has left colonists with very hazardous conditions with corrosive rain and snow, no breathable air outside of their airlocked environment. The people of Earth destroyed themselves 20 years prior to the opening of the book through nuclear war, so Earth is pretty much gone, and the colonists, what's left of them, are on their own, and they have to survive on this processed excrement from a fungus that thrives on Mars. This processed excrement provides food, drink, smoking, so they make cigarettes from it, their tea, their alcohol, and all of their food, and from what every character states, it tastes terrible. So basically, life on Mars is no better roses. The main protagonist, David Adler, paints a very grim and hopeless picture of colony life on Mars with his acerbic wit and sarcasm. He's a very jaded everyman who's unwillingly thrust into a murder mystery, and he is determined to, to solve it. The plot is well thought out, and the story does grip the reader, and it does not let go until the end. Like life, it's filled with crazy situations, crushing failures, sorrows, small triumphs, and touches of humor. I did find myself not really ever liking, truly liking this protagonist, but I did start to respect him by the end of the book. He's just a little, just a touch outside my realm of what I am comfortable with with people. Secondary characters are a wide sweeping mix of punks and thieves, drunkards and zealots, and one or two redeemable, decent folk. There are great cast of characters, the personalities, and none of them felt too dimensional or just tossed in to make a scene. The religious zealot is probably one of the scarier ones I've read in recent times. The dialogue flowed very well, was snappy. I didn't notice any misspellings or grammatical or syntax errors. I don't know much about the science the book presents, but it holds up very well in the book. It's very believable in the context of the story. So the science did not detract from the story at all or confuse the readers. It was very simply explained in layman's terms so you aren't confused with lots of strange jargon. I did have one major issue with the book that almost made me give up reading it. The second paragraph of chapter two does give the readers a descriptive info dump on what the character looks like by having him look in a mirror. This is a huge pet peeve for me. For me, it just shows just bad writing skills. Anyhow, getting past that pet peeve, I forced myself to keep reading this book, and I'm honestly glad that I did, because the remainder of the book did keep my attention, and it threw a lot of surprising curves and twists until the very end. I did not see the end coming until probably five or six pages before I got there, and it was pleasantly surprising. Also, toward the end of the book, I did find myself empathizing with the main character and his associates and even kind of cheering him on. So if, however, you are seeking a happy ending, you won't find it here. If you enjoy post-apocalyptic sci-fi that gives you a sharp dose of hopelessness, this one is worth reading. And I did rate this book four to five stars. Again, uh, I took a star off mainly because I have issues with people describing themselves in a mirror in a book, especially so early on, like chapter two. My third book today is called Salt and Broom by Sharon Lynn Fisher. It was published by 47 North on the 1st of December of 2023. This is a very new book. It has 282 ebook pages. Again, this is one that uh, through Kindle Unlimited, it is free to borrow. Otherwise, it is $4.99 for the ebook, $14.44 for the paperback. $19.99 for the audio CD, and $30.99 on Audible unless you have a credit to spend. It can also be found at Barnes & Noble for $16.99 paperback, $19.99 for an MP3 audio CD, 
or $26.99 for a standard CD. So this is sort of a cross between a gothic and a historical fantasy. It is a retelling of one of my favorite classic books by Charlotte Bronte, Jane Eyre. So in this magical retelling of Jane Eyre, the school of Lockwood, the students can very cautiously study witchcraft, just not as openly as they would like. Witchcraft is still frowned upon, although it is no longer illegal. The book does skip Jane's dismal childhood and opens instead with her being a teacher of witchcraft at the school. Her backstory has changed, as well as much of Mr. Rochester's. He no longer has a ward. He no longer has a living wife. And instead of being hired to be a tutor to the ward or a governess, Jane has been hired as a witch to rid Thornfield of heavy shadows that lie over it. The characters are fairly well developed, borrowing quite heavily on the characters of the original Jane Eyre, but they also change the spelling of the name for the heroine. Still Jane Eyre, spelled differently. They aren't wholly original characters to this writer because she is borrowing from them, but what she does change is very well done. The changes are made fit the plot structure, and there are fewer characters in the story, so they don't bog down with extraneous people and unnecessary scenes. Jane is still strong-willed and speaks her mind. Mr. Rochester is still gruff force of nature. And their personalities, the core personalities, have stayed the same. The plot only loosely follows the original Bronte tale, erasing Jane's backstory, eliminating her for harsh family history. However, it's replaced with one that is equally compelling and intriguing. I can't go into it because that would give you spoilers. The added element of the supernatural makes this an intriguing tale that kept me turning the pages. The dialogue flowed well, stayed true to the Victorian feel. Nothing felt forced or unnatural. The pacing was also smooth and fitting for the tale. And again, I did not notice any spelling, grammatical, or syntax errors. I genuinely enjoyed this revision of one of my favorite classics. It was tastefully and respectfully done. I didn't find anything to dislike about this book, and I rate this one five out of five stars. So that is my reviews for today. I will return next week with more book reviews. If you are enjoying this podcast, please remember to like and subscribe. There will be more interviews with authors, songwriters, and people from the publishing world in the following months, as well as more book reviews. So 10,000 Books and More is an Owl and Dragonfly production in association with a bookish kind of art. Until next time, peace and be safe.